In this week's Property Insider video, Dr. Andrew Wilson and I talk about the rental crisis happening around Australia. We also discuss what's happening to property values, the fact that there are hardly enough people to fill all the job vacancies, and what's happening to auction markets. So if you want to keep up to date with what's happening in our property markets, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, join 10,000 other subscribers, and click the little bell icon so we can keep you up to date each time a new show comes out. Australia is in the middle of a rental crisis and there's no relief in sight for tenants with tight rental markets continuing to push up rents for both houses and units in our capital cities. And the news is full of stories about spiralling rents forcing families into social housing where the waiting lists are even worse than private rentals. And I've even read stories where people are having to live in tents in Tasmania because they can't find proper rental accommodation. So I'm interested to discuss the latest My Housing Market Rental Report with Dr Andrew Wilson. I'm also keen to hear his views on the latest job vacancy data and get a recap of what's happening to our house prices now that we're halfway into the calendar year. Hi, Andrew. Yes, uh, hello, Michael. Well, Andrew, the rental crisis seems like there's no sign of easing with vacancy rates dropping to the lowest point nationally since April 2006 and capital city rents have risen 15.6% in the last 12 months alone for houses. Andrew, it seems like there's a lot less properties on the market for rent at present, but there are a lot more people looking for rental accommodation at the moment. Yes, we've been discussing this for quite some time, Michael, of course, the, the, uh, the real crisis, and I don't use that word lightly, and it certainly is when people can't find accommodation, and I guess we call that the, the, the tenure, renting is the tenure for those that aren't as wealthy or don't have the financial support that uh, typically homeowners do have, so they are more of a marginalised group, and when there is a shortage of rental accommodation, and, and there's no real, I guess, uh, controls over how, how high rents can go, there are some controls, but uh, at the end of the day, tenants have to pay what the market is demanding. And uh, the only relief we could possibly have to this uh, situation is more properties for rent. Uh, and we have been underbuilding more or less for the last six years, despite that surge we had last year through Home Builder. So we just don't have enough rental properties available. And on the demand side, unfortunately, we're seeing more demand coming through with borders opening. Of course, that means international migration resuming, it's international students coming into the market. So the outside demand uh, source is only going to put more pressure on properties that are available. And of course, the data is clearly showing that, Michael. In fact, we only have one capital city now that has uh, house rents under $500 a week, and that's Melbourne. We have Sydney, Darwin and Canberra. Canberra's at $700 a week. Darwin and Sydney are over $600 a week and pushing towards $700 a week. In fact, Sydney's rent increased by 3.1%, Michael, over the month. So um, that's heading inexorably towards $700 a week, I believe. And that is a massive increase over the last couple of years. And this, again, is a negative factor for the economy and inflation because it does put pressure on tenants to be looking for extra income, which is another factor in uh, not just with prices for general goods and services, but rents obviously take up a large proportion of, the, of a tenant's household budget. So now they'll be looking for relief, which means demands for higher wages, which is just what the Reserve Bank really doesn't want. Well, Investors are slowly coming back into the market to provide a little bit of extra stock, but not in large enough numbers to significantly increase the supply. And we're not building enough apartments, as you said. In fact, there's evidence that a number of what they call shovel-ready housing projects are being abandoned in response to soaring construction costs, jumping interest rates, uncertain end values, and the developers are having difficulty getting finance. So we can't build the apartments or the new homes in the quantities that are required, Andrew. Yeah, and the point is, Michael, we, we actually need new housing. Even if we get higher numbers of investors, it's just rotating existing stock. They're buying from those that might be moving into another property, but again, it's just a rotation of existing stock. So it's not really increasing the overall number of dwellings that we have to house our population. And as I said, uh, certainly we're not, at, even with uh, higher numbers of investors, getting 
the number of rental properties to offset increased demand from as a result of closed borders. And of course, we're seeing a lot of travel at the moment, Michael. So there's a lot of Airbnb temporary accommodation that's uh, back in town. That's very difficult to get Airbnb now. And Airbnb rents are rising strongly as well. That's short-term holiday and business accommodation. And that's just taking more stock out of the permanent market, Michael, which was added to during COVID to some degree when borders were closed. So uh, there's no really good news there. Even the, the sub-markets, which had an excess of supply, and we're talking about inner suburban Sydney units and units in Melbourne's CBD, their uh, vacancy rates have more than halved over the last year. And they're quickly being absorbed now, Michael. And of course, they will be a target for open borders, international migrants and uh, students, but also they're becoming a target for uh, those that are being marginalised because they can't afford to rent a house. You know, they're now looking at units, families are looking at units because that's all they can afford. And uh, there's really nothing, you know, that can be done about this. And it works its way back to some degree with the credit restrictions that were placed on investors in uh, uh, around five or six years ago that remained uh, really in force until recently. And also, as you said, Michael, the restrictions that developers have for finance as well. And it's not just finance restrictions for developers, it's all the red and green tape that developers have to push their way through, uh, stringent planning requirements. Uh, it just means that it's creating even more of a bottleneck for new development coming through when it's sorely needed in our rental markets. Well, further compounding that is the fact that many investors sold up over the last few years. We've noticed it in the many properties that we've managed at Metropole, but speaking to other industry colleagues as well, and most of them have been bought by owner-occupiers. Now, I'm not sure why investors sold up. I guess they've been spooked because their properties did what they were meant to do. They went up in value. And I think there's also household sizes are shrinking, Andrew. A lot of tenants who previously shared accommodation, they're now working flexibly flexible hours, some working from home some of the time. And so they're starting to look for their own accommodation. They realise they can't work as easily with as many people around them. Well, yes, Michael, as I said, it's uh, becoming a perfect storm in the rental market, certainly a perfect storm for investors who now can really, whichever legislative restrictions there are on the timing and the duration of rent increases, they can just go for the doctor now and ask really whatever they like, which may perhaps have some issues of, uh, you know, conscience for them. But uh, really, with such a strong demand for rental properties, investors really have an obligation to maximise their returns. And they can mm. certainly do that uh, just about everywhere at the moment. And it's interesting, Michael, this isn't just a a local experience. We're seeing similar large cities experience, particularly the US experiencing, uh, which have more free market type of rental environments, experiencing rental shortages. In fact, New York is uh, certainly having a, a similar rental crisis to our major capital cities at the moment. Now, we caught up between our regular weekly property insider videos with your end of month statistics and you showed that now that we're halfway through the year sydney and melbourne house prices falling the other capital cities are still doing okay yeah, yeah. so it doesn't seem that it's interest rates that's causing that like some of the negative nellies and property pessimists are telling us because sydney melbourne which is falling is experiencing the same interest rates as Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth that are going up. Well, that's right, Michael, absolutely. And this has been just a, a factor of booming house prices that have uh, placed the ceiling on the capacity of buyers to continue to push prices up. We've seen that occurring really over the last six months. I mean, it was the middle of last year, really, where Melbourne and Sydney house prices growth peaked. It's been coming really? back ever since. And because they were the early leaders in the current cycle and they were really experiencing very strong prices growth up until the middle of last year and through to the end but it did decline and it declined because of affordability constraints we can't just keep going to the bank and asking for, for more money to pay higher prices because the bank uh, has stringent lending regulations and of course a lot of the pent-up demand that was created through COVID lockdowns that's also been released and it was uh, Sydney and Melbourne that experienced the worst of the lockdowns. So that's where the most pent up demand was created. Now that's been released, buyers have satisfied their needs and um, those affordability barriers have started to push prices down. Now that's obviously being exacerbated to some degree by the fear factor. A lot of negative headlines, as you suggested, mean that what we see, and we've seen this previously, we saw this in 2018 and 19, buyers and sellers tend to sit on their hands when they're being inundated with all these 
crazy predictions of house price crashes. Now, of course, people who don't have to buy or sell will will wait and see until uh, you know there's a bit more clear air, and that'll take uh, typically, as we saw in eight, 18, 19, around about eighteen months, perhaps. But you can't speculate because conditions are different, and in fact, conditions are probably better now in terms of the economy and the underlying supply and demand factors in our housing markets than they were back in eighteen nineteen. So um, we wait for this to unfold, but, but certainly it's not just a question of house prices falling everywhere. We now have uh, Melbourne and Sydney down by just under 2% over the June quarter, but there was still good solid growth in Adelaide and Brisbane, just under 3% or in the mid twos, which is a good result. It's still annualised double figure growth, but they've come back well again because of affordability barriers, Michael, from their peaks of the end of last year. But they they were late to come to the boom, so they're obviously going to be late to finish to the boom. And they're certainly you know much more affordable. Their medians are much lower than Melbourne and Sydney, and of course incomes are around about the same. So they've got a little way to go, but no doubt they're easing as well. And the fear factor will impact them through winter and into spring, Michael. Again, regardless of the local factors, and Perth had another solid result as well. So there's nothing surprising here, Michael, and nothing cataclysmic in terms of the outlook for our housing markets, but this is uh, all testing the confidence of buyers and sellers. But at the end of the day, they'll shake themselves off as they did in 2019 and realise that there's some good buying opportunities out there in a strong economy and um, the the market will then start to find its bottom and, and grow again. Well, we know that fear and greed drives our markets in the yeah. short term. And at the moment, fear is bigger than greed. But eventually, as you say, greed will overtake and people have got to get on with their lives. Yeah. And consumers are nervous. But one thing they don't seem to be nervous about at the moment, Andrew, is their jobs or job prospects. Australia's staffing shortage seems to have worsened. There's only about half a million jobs available, meaning the number of vacant jobs is now almost equal to the number of unemployed. Well, it'll be interesting as the data is released coming forward, Michael, the unemployment rate will be released in a fortnight's time, uh, and that will be for June. We are at a record low unemployment uh, level at the moment, and that's a record for the monthly surveys. We've also had a record for participation rate, so I'm not sure where we're going to draw extra labour from So that'll only put downward pressure on the unemployment rate. So A, that will be interesting. Of course, the other factor will be whether we'll start to see wages growth coming through. It's been disappointing, but the Reserve Bank seems particularly confident that we'll start to see wages growth uh, plus 3%. It believes that most employers are providing that now, while its sources are telling them that uh, a lot of wage increases above 3% are being negotiated at the moment. So that'll be interesting. Again, not sure if the Reserve Bank wants a bit of a runaway wages environment, Michael. It's not the best thing for inflation. And that's probably what's helped keep us uh, a lot lower than other similar economies in terms of the inflation rate. Well, we've got to get more people coming in, skilled migrants from overseas, but there seems to be bottlenecks in that, Andrew. Well, that's right, Michael. It it hasn't had the flow through that perhaps we would have expected. It will be there. I mean, the government is committed to 200,000, which is the normal intake we have had prior to COVID, of course. And that does provide a lot of job potential. But an an increase in labour means it should put upward pressure on the unemployment rate. But if we've got such strong demand for labour, it might actually neutralise. So as I said, it will be interesting to see what happens going forward, whether that uh, stream of migrants can offset unemployment. But I think the issue with the labour market, Michael, will be the attempts by the Reserve Bank to uh, moderate Mm. demand. We're already seeing the US showing signs of some uh, perhaps disturbing economic results now from higher interest rates. Early days, of course, and central banks are all hoping that it'll have a soft landing. But I think that tends to be, in these circumstances, wishful thinking. And uh, look, the other point, Michael, is we saw some relief from the price of oil over the last week, but it's then now started, started to pick up again over the past few days. So not a lot of joy in terms of uh, the cost of petrol for Australians. Of course, we know that's a significant driver of inflation, but the real fear is it's starting to spread through generalised goods and services. And uh, a lot of people are seeing the results of shortages, particularly of food now at the moment, and that's a concern. I think vendors are also a little bit nervous, so there don't seem to be as many having put their properties up for auction over the weekend. But of course, there was the holidays as well yeah. which and the rain and the weather unfortunately the floods so how did the auction results go over the weekend Andrew? Well, look, I think auction markets are standing up reasonably well given all the 
white noise that running around in terms of fear and uh, loathing of the housing market and what's to happen. So clearance rates really have been reasonably steady over the past month. As you said, Michael, it is the school holiday period everywhere. Uh, it means we get a lower proportion of higher priced properties in the auction market. But as I said, the clearance rates are holding. Uh, numbers are low, but they've been low really for a, a number of months compared to last year. Melbourne, the market where we did see a bigger shakeout in auction numbers at the weekend. But again, the Melbourne market held at around about the levels it's been over the past month. We had a lot of rain in Sydney on, uh, on Saturday. That didn't affect the market as it doesn't really tend to. People will buy in any circumstances if they really want a property. But there's no, I mean, we're into July, Michael, you know, happy July. So we're into the mid, the, really into midwinter now. And we do expect uh, a, a lot of distractions from holidays, from uh, the midwinter hiatus in the market. And uh, July will be a slower market and added to with a lot of the negativity around. We've still got uh, a little bit of school holidays to run as well. But as I said, I think the markets are holding. The one market that's really pulled its uh, downwards has been the Canberra market, Michael. But that was, if we remember not so long ago, clearly the strongest market in the country. And they were reg at regularly producing 90% clearance rates uh, weekend after weekend. And they're now the underperformance, just above 50% clearance rates. But again, we need to recognise that uh, when we had similar circumstances of a lot of negativity in the market, uh, at the end of 2018, we had clearance rates that were in the low 40s. So uh, we're well above that now. Obviously, the, the energy is downwards and the sentiment is downwards. Um, but, you know, Michael, we're only a month and a bit away from the spring selling season. So um, that'll be interesting. Well, vendors are getting a bit nervous. They're selling before auction. Yes. Uh, auctions are being passed in and they're selling straight after. And there seems to be a tendency of some agents not reporting auctions, which makes it just a little bit harder to get an understanding of what's going on. But there must be a reason why they're not doing that, Andrew. Well, they don't, they're not for publication, Michael. They report, but they don't, they say, well, not for publication because they don't want their, I guess, their brand out there saying that it was not successful. And look, that's human nature, isn't it? We want to celebrate our successes and uh, we don't celebrate what we perceive to be a failure when a property passes in. But uh, at the margin, we still have the same trend lines and we just look at the trend lines and that tells us whether the market's rising or falling. And certainly the markets are generally holding at the moment. I think one has to differentiate between what's on the market and A-grade homes and investment-grade properties. There's still the depth of uh, buyers there. Yes, and, and the point is there's, there's a lack of stock at this time of the year in those properties because the sellers tend to be a lot more discretionary in that end of the market. And a lot of them are on lengthy holidays as we speak. So another interesting week ahead for us. I look forward to catching up next week and discussing what's happening in our property markets, Andrew. Thank you, Michael.